I just want to say to many of you who've reached out to me over the last few weeks and months with um, phone calls or emails or on social media to thank me for doing these virtual tour series. I truly appreciate it and it, it really does warm my heart to know that these presentations are valued so much and that we're making a difference in so many lives. So thank you very much. Um, I want to share a little bit about myself for those of you who don't know me. As I said, my name is Mara Walsh. I am in the United States and specifically between Philadelphia and New York. I started leading physical tours with EF Tours as a leader for girl travel, taking girls and their families to international destinations every summer. I have since expanded my travel program, my physical travel program that is, and um, I now do adult, tours as well as family friendly tours with teenagers and their parents. Please note that even though my travel group started as girl travel tours catering to girl trips, you'll also start to see the name getaway travel tours being used to help alleviate any confusion of who's eligible to join our tours and travel with us. We welcome both men and women, as well as teenagers um, on up for certain tours. Certain tours are just adult only tours, but certain tours are multi-generational tours. Now, I also lead adult only tours, as I said, with EF Go Ahead Tours, as well as several other tour organizers. Um, I am also a certified travel agent and I can book on, you on a dream trip, whether that is part of a group or on your own. So just reach out to me if you're starting to think about physical travel again and let me know where you'd like to go and I can help you either connect with the proper group or find a way for you to get to your destination. In terms of virtual tours, there are a couple reasons I started these. I really wanted to support the tour directors and tour guides all over the world during this time of travel restrictions where they have not been able to work. And I really wanted to keep the excitement of travel alive for my travel group and extend that opportunity to those of you who have learned about these tours through their friend, their friends, their family, social media, and what other other means they've come to you by. We've done more than 30, maybe even 40 tours in the last year since COVID has struck. If you'd like to access any of the recordings, they're available on my website, girltraveltours.com. There is a virtual tour drop-down menu where you'll be able to access all of them. You can also access them through my YouTube channel, Girl Travel Tours, and my Facebook page. And we have several more tours planned for the coming year. We're gonna review those now so that you know what's coming so that you can register. We have Jerusalem next week, Belgium, Portugal, Mystery on the Danube with the River Cruise, South of France, Ancient Rome, Sydney, Australia, Wales and Cornwall, the Taj Mahal, Venice, and Western Scotland. These are all been added to my website, so you can go up and register at any time and get on the list to receive the confirmation and the link to join the Zoom. And I'm in the midst of planning the end of summer months and even into the fall at this point. So get excited for a lot more destinations to come. As long as you're interested in viewing these virtual tour presentations, we will continue to produce them for you. I know that many of you have found my virtual events through Facebook and some of you are on Facebook today, so welcome. Uh, I just wanna shout out again and warn everybody about the scammers on Facebook. Um, as, as many of you know, but some of you don't, they make fake pages and events by copying legitimate events like mine. And they are doing this um, with my name, my email, my, my photos. So it looks a lot like me, but it isn't. And the main difference is they ask for a credit card for you to enter an event. And in my case, I will never ask you for a credit card to enter a free virtual event. So please never give a credit card to enter. Um, obviously, if you want to tip the tour director later with a credit card, that is up to you and that you are in control of. But you have, you have seen my events in order to judge them whether you choose to tip or not. You can always safely access our events through my website, Girl Travel Tours. 
and obviously um, the Facebook page. But I really ask you not to click on any of the suspicious links that might be coming in on that feed because um, these, these scammers take advantage of these events to get people to click through. Okay, before we get going, I wanna share with you a few ways that you can interact with us. As I said, feel free to ask questions about the tour, the tour director and my travel program in the Q&A. The Q&A, we really like to save for questions that we're going to address at the end of the tour. So those are read aloud and we address the answers aloud. If you would also like to interact with me during the time that we're online, you can interact with me via the chat and I will try to address all of the questions and comments that come through via the chat. And obviously, if you're on Facebook, enjoy the feed, talk to one another and really um, and, and really be a part of the event. OK, so also I always like to um, I always like to share an interactive poll and tonight's poll is not that different from any week that we've done, which is tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your connection to Mexico? I've been and I love it. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future. I have no set plans, but I'm interested in the destination. I am solely interested in experiencing it virtually. So I'll give you a minute as you answer that poll question. Looks like we have a little more than 50% of the people who have answered it. Um, I'm gonna give you a little second. It looks like that so many people have been to Mexico already, but not, uh, not more than half. So that's interesting. I'm gonna end the poll. I'm gonna share the results so that you can see them. And as you can see, we have about 48% that have been and loved it. We have a lot of people that have no set plans, but they're interested in the destination. And I think everybody's interested in the destination of Mexico on Cinco de Mayo, aren't they, right? So I'm gonna stop sharing. If you, do, if you don't see that poll disappear, you can go up and click the top left button, which will take it off your screen. So as we see, today's virtual tour is to Puebla, Mexico, the place that made Cinco de Mayo famous. This virtual tour presentation is scheduled for 90 minutes plus a Q&A. So I hope you're ready with a margarita and a snack, maybe some, I don't know, some chips and dip, um, and we're ready to enjoy the next hour or so. And as we know, a group tour would not be complete without a fantastic tour guide. And today's tour guide is like, um, when you're with a group, a tour director is like a personal concierge who stays with our group from start to finish. Uh, she shares a world of knowledge and manages all of our travel plans. And she makes sure that our experience is full of learning, fun, and culture. These are by far the most important people in a group when they're doing their job well, which they always do. And if we're not traveling, these tour guides have not been able to work. So I will share with you via chat and in the Q&A, how you can tip the tour guide if you are so inclined. All of the tips go directly to the guide, minus out our Zoom and operating expenses. I'm hoping that this virtual tour will not only keep our desire to travel alive, but also allow a tour guide to do what she does best, which is share her knowledge and passion for travel to her country. Today, we are lucky to have a Mexican tour guide who lives in Puebla and is very well versed in its history, its culture, and its cuisine. Alejandra, if you are ready, come on and say hola to our guests and get ready to share your screen. Hola, can you hear me now? <laughs> you are good, Alejandra. Excellent. Let me share my screen. So. Are we good here? Perfect. Okay, just let me change to the beginning. Okay, so welcome everybody. I'm so happy to be here today with you. Thank you so much, Mara, for this uh, invitation and also for allowing me to share with all our virtual travelers just a little bit of Mexico and especially of my hometown, which is 
Puebla. I was reading that you are located in all around the world, so I'm pretty impressed. And I just want to thank you for coming tonight or here is still evening. So thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I hope that today you can get important information, interesting information, and I really, really hope that you can come in the future. So I'm gonna start with this uh, nice picture of my hometown. I was born here in Puebla. So uh, people who are from Puebla, we are called poblanos. So maybe you have heard something related with poblano, like poblano food or poblano pepper. So that would be the, the name for us. And in the last years, I have shared my life between Mexico City and Puebla. So basically I have been living in central Mexico. And I'm gonna talk about our itinerary, first of all. Uh, what are we gonna do today? What are we gonna talk about? Because our country is so big that it will be very hard to, to talk about all these regions. So first of all, I would like to share with you general information about Puebla, where do we are, why it's important, what weather uh, can you enjoy here? And after that, I would like to share with you uh, something very, very important, which is the Battle of Puebla, or uh, famous as the Cinco de Mayo. If you know what I'm talking about, that's perfect. If you don't know, no problem. I wanna be sharing with you more information and explaining a little bit more about this important event, because today is May the 5th. And after that, I want to take you to downtown, no, through the pictures. I know it's hard to pass through the skin uh, a taco or a torta. I know it's impossible, but through the pictures, I hope that you can see how Puebla is famous for having this uh, amazing food. No, Not only this fancy food that you find in restaurants, but also food that you find on the street. So that's our plan for today. So we have a map here of Mexico. And I know that some of you have been in Mexico before, but where have you been, no? Most of the people, when they travel to Mexico, they tell me, I have been only to the Riviera Maya, I have been to Baja California, basically to these uh, resorts. If you haven't, that's good for you. And, and if you have also, it's good for you because that is still part of Mexico. So please write down in the comments, where exactly have you been? And if you have been in Puebla, let me know. I would be more than happy to read that maybe tomorrow. So people say that uh, Mexico is not only one country. People say that our country is three countries. And why? Because it's so diverse. We have such a vast history and such a vast territory that people say that if you go to the North, it's completely different, no? Basically, which that would be here, close to the border, where people eat burritos, and you know, eh, the weather is so hot. But what about the center, the center of Mexico? If you come here to this region where we are, that would be very different in terms of eh, also weather. And if you go to the south, that would be this region, no? South, eh, eh, where you find Cancun and the Riviera Maya, that would be the Mayan area. So where we are right now, or where I am, is here in Puebla. This is the state of Puebla. And the capital has the same name. It is Puebla City. And Puebla City is today ranking number four as the largest city of Mexico. First is Mexico City, of course, one of the largest cities in, in not only in Mexico, in, in the world. Uh, there are around 20 million people, including the metropolitan area. And after that is Guadalajara on the Pacific. After Guadalajara, that would be a Monterrey on the north. And then is Puebla. Puebla is today around one and a half million inhabitants plus the metropolitan area. So we are talking about more than two million inhabitants. And another important thing to know of Puebla is that uh, we have a high elevation, no? Our elevation is around 7,000 feet. So it's not the same as if you go to, as I mentioned before, to the Riviera Maya, which is flat. So this is an important uh, thing because as you know, geography also dictates kind of the history and also dictates how people are gonna be and some of the traditions. 
And the other important thing of us, of Poblanos, is that we are very, very close to Mexico City. On the map, I put this yellow star, so you can see how close we are from the capital, from Mexico City. That would be in, in time, only two hours, and in distance, that would be around 120 kilometers. So whenever you want to come, you can fly directly to Puebla. We have an international airport, or you can come to Mexico City, and after that, you can take a bus. And also, this is important to know, and this has to do with our history. What happened in the past is that Puebla became the second most important city. Why? Because when travelers, when the conquerors of Mexico, when the Spanish, when Europeans, when these people came from Europe, they arrived directly to the harbor of Veracruz. And Veracruz was right here on the Gulf of Mexico. And before going to the capital, they had to pass through Puebla. So basically, Puebla also was the door to the capital. And this is important to, to know today, especially because we are going to talk about the Battle Cinco de Mayo. So let me show you some pictures of our landscape. And this picture, you maybe saw it in this uh, virtual tour uh, marketing, or <laughs> Mara showed you a, 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 a picture of the volcano. Next to us, we have this volcano, which is pretty famous. It's called the Popocatépetl. I know it's hard to pronounce. Basically, the name is not Spanish. The name is in the native language. And this would be the second highest summit of Mexico. It is an active volcano since 1994. So before that, it was sleeping. And I remember when my parents took me to see, to see the, the volcano from the distance, of, of course, and it, it became active. So this is one of the most uh, important mountains and it means a smoky mountain. It is in Nahuatl. So this is our landmark of Puebla. But this volcano is not alone. Next to it, we have another important mountain that is the Iztaccíhuatl or the white uh, mountain, the white woman. Actually, they are a national park for those who like hiking and like nature, etc. This is a very good spot to, to visit. And these volcanoes are between Mexico City and Puebla. On the north side, we have another important volcano, which is the Malinche. That would be in between another state, the state of Tlaxcala, right here on the north, and Puebla. And this volcano protects us from the winds. No, from these other uh, temperatures. But what about the other side? On the other side of Puebla, on the uh, east, uh, south, southeast, we have the Pico de Orizaba. The Pico de Orizaba is also a gorgeous volcano. It's not active. It was a long, long time ago. And this would be the highest summit. So this is important to show you that Puebla, uh, it is a very different. It's not that the same as if you were uh, on the nice beach of, of Mexico. So, and why is also important of Puebla? No? Why is considered an important city to visit? Well, because since 1987, the historic center of Puebla became world heritage. Uh, thanks to our architecture, our uh, monuments, they decided to decree uh, this UNESCO heritage site. And we have a list of more than 2,000 monuments in the historic center. But let me put more pictures so you can see how is Puebla. In this map, I want to show you where is the heart of the city. The heart of the city would be, again, this little star. And Puebla, you must know that uh, Puebla is not like some other uh, cities of Mexico. If you go to Oaxaca or if you go to Mexico City, there was a pre-Hispanic civilization. So uh, most of the time when you are traveling in Mexico, you visit these temples and these pyramids. But that was not the case in Puebla. In Puebla, we didn't have any indigenous civilization on this spot, basically. 
So what happened is that when the Spanish came to Mexico and after they conquered the, the territory, the only city that was close to Puebla was Cholula. Cholula has a, an important uh, pyramid, but they didn't want to mix with the native people. So what they wanted to do is to create a new city a city only for Spanish, a city that had this European influence. So what they did is to move a little bit uh, far from Cholula and they founded the city of Puebla in 1531. So that was a long, long time ago. And they named our city, the city Ciudad de la Puebla de Los Angeles, which means Puebla City of Angels. That is why in our coat of arms, you can see two angels holding the towers of the cathedral. And also you can see the letters KB in honor to Carlos V. He was the, the king of, of Spain while Puebla was founded. Why do we have angels? Well, that is another story and that is a, a legend. Uh, people say that the bishop who had to come here and found the city, he had a dream and in his dream, he saw angels tracing the city. So he was like, oh, that's a good idea. Maybe that would be the name of Puebla, Puebla city of angels. And Puebla basically means Pueblo. You know that Pueblo is town, no? So he was committed or he, they, he, he was told to go to this uh, area and found a new city. So that is the meaning of our coat of arms. And well, uh, at that time, the city uh, was built close to a river. That's why I draw this line in blue. So you can see that Puebla was a city with a very, very important river. The river At uh, Atoyac and the river San Francisco. It was not the only one. There were some different rivers. And at that time, the Spanish and the society were not mixed. Remember that I told you that the Spanish didn't want to mix with the indigenous people? Well, here it's a, I put some pictures to, to explain you in a better way. On the left side, on this big area, was the place or the city for Spanish. On this side, there were convents no, for nuns, there were monasteries for friars, there were families that, of course, they were rich, and there was the house of the bishop, no? And only on this side is where we are going to find these beautiful houses with beautiful facades and balconies. But what was happening on the other side? Well, on the other side of the river were these indigenous people. These indigenous people that came from the surroundings of Puebla, and they had to build the city. So for many years, this division existed, but at the same time, this division uh, also allow us to have today uh, some of the handcrafts or some of the neighborhoods that still keep the traditions. On this side, we have a, a neighborhood that still produces the pottery. And also we have one of the oldest uh, glass uh, companies that produce the glass for the Spanish. So this was the kind of life at that time. But today we don't have any more this division, of course, you don't have to worry about whenever you come, you can hang around wherever you want. And the only thing that has changed a lot is that this river got polluted. So unfortunately, this river was encased in the 60s, more or less, and now it has become a big boulevard the Boulevard Cinco de Mayo, like the Battle Cinco de Mayo. Okay, so today we are gonna start our tour right here in our trolley in the center of Puebla. In the center of Puebla is where you can find these buses, They're very affordable. You can always have different options. And what we want to do today is to continue this route. I'm gonna take you through this red line. We are gonna take the Boulevard Cinco de Mayo, and then we are gonna go to the north. We are gonna go up to the hill. There is a hill here. I'm gonna explain you here the Battle of Puebla. And then we are gonna go back to center. And here in this region, I'm gonna take you to 
some food uh, restaurants and stands. Are you ready? Because I am. So here we are. We are in downtown. We are in the main square of Puebla. Look how it beautiful it is. Every colonial city in Mexico has a Zócalo. That would be the, the name or, or the word that we use for this, uh, for this place. And well, from here you can see the, not only the fountain, the fountain that is quite famous because it is dedicated to St. Michael Archangel. And there is a story that someone stole this uh, old uh, fountain long, long time ago, but then they could uh, rescue the fountain and it's again here in the main square. But what you can also see here from, from here is that uh, our buildings are like pretty very well preserved. No? You can see the cathedral and immediately you can see the cupola, the cupola of Puebla and also one part of the cathedral is painted in purple. No? Many, many buildings of Puebla are like this and somehow also it helps to preserve the, the monuments. So what we do usually here in downtown is to come during the weekends or whenever you have time. Of course, if you are visitors, you can come every day. And one of the things that you're gonna find is the balloon man. So this is a picture that I love very much because I think this represents Puebla and, and this represents how the daily life is in Mexico. But if you don't have kids, don't worry, because also here around the, the Socalvo, you always have a good option to have churros and hot chocolate. Or if you don't want hot chocolate, you can find coffee or tea or whatever. So this is the daily life in our Socalvo. And after that, I want to show you a little bit of this cathedral. This cathedral was built also in the 16th century it took over 200 years to finish the construction. So imagine how, how much, how many people have to come and work and these indigenous people that I, I mentioned. But this cathedral is very special and it is not that I am from Puebla. It is also because of the height of the towers. This cathedral supposed to have the highest towers of Mexico as a church. They are 73 meters. And the other thing you can appreciate from here is that around the, the cathedral, no, around the atrium, we have these sculptures that are angels. Now you know why do we have angels. But what else is important of this cathedral? That if you go into the cathedral, basically it's like a museum. We have tons of things and tons of art, sacred art, of course, that uh, you, can, uh, you can see and you can enjoy. For example, the organ. The organ of the cathedral, it's called the international organ. And this uh, organ is also one of the largest, maybe in the picture doesn't look like, but it is, believe me. And it is called the international organ because the pieces were made or they were coming from different parts of the world, like the pipes, the pipes, they were coming from Germany. The electronic system came from Buffalo, New York, and the wood is Mexican wood. So if you are lucky and you go inside one day, you can even listen to the music of this organ. What else do we have inside the cathedral? Well, we have a lot of paintings. Puebla being a city for Spanish, they always were competing. They always wanted to have the best of the best. So um, between Mexico City and, and Puebla, we have a lot of these famous painters coming and making this art. In this case, I am showing you the cupola, the cupola, the main cupola that was painted by Cristóbal de Villalpán. So this is one of the few cupolas in our country that was painted with this technique that is called fresco, al fresco, no? And Another picture to show you how it's inside is the tabernacle. The tabernacle that also was built in 20 years. Today, this piece is also very important because 
It was designed by Manuel Tolsa, one of the best uh, architects. And also this would be um, like the catacombs. Right here down, we preserve or we have the remains of the most important bishops of Puebla. So this would be in your list if you want to come to Puebla. But let me show you other things. We have the Palafoxian Library. That, what is the Palafoxian Library? Well, it is the first public library in the Americas. And this has to do again with the Society of Puebla. No? In Puebla, always there were important people. And one of these persons or characters at that time was a man, a man whose name was Palafox, Juan de Palafox. So this man was the ninth bishop of Puebla, and he got the idea to create a public library for everybody. Because before him, the knowledge or these books, they were not for everybody. So thanks to him and his ideas, more like liberal ideas, is that today we have this beautiful space. It's a museum, it's not public anymore. So in case you want to come and read, no, I'm sorry, but that doesn't work like that. But uh, you can come inside and you can walk around. And uh, of course, you can have always a guide that would explain everything about this library. What is important to mention here is uh, about the architecture. No? The architecture is a saloon library, it's a wide open space, but also look to the floor. No? The floor is the original floor from that time. And it's so beautiful because it is made with ceramic and red bricks. But also the library has um, books that they are named the incunable books. These incunable books are just priceless. We have nine of them and they were basically the first books that were printed with the first presses of the world. That's why they are very, very important. And well, today the, the library has an acquire of more than 43,000 volumes. So that's why it's a very, very important space. Another thing you can visit in Puebla is the Alfenique Museum. Look to this house, isn't it amazing? Well, this is just an example of how Puebla's um, architecture looks like. So this house is today a museum, is the Museum of the State. And what you are gonna find inside, it is like a replica of how it was a house from that time, but not any house, of course. This is how the rich people, the rich society lived at that time. And there is a very, very funny story of this house because supposed to be a woman that was very beautiful. No, this woman, of course, she was a single, Everybody wanted to marry her, but it was not easy. And then there was an admirer of her that wanted really to, to marry her. So when he asked, would you marry me? She said, yeah, but I, I have a condition. Only if you built a house of sugar or a house of candy for me, I'm going to accept. And this is what he did. He said, okay, I have, en I have enough money. And after some months, he built this house. So Alfenique was a candy and uh, the, the candy was made out of sugar. And that's why up, you can see that it looks like if the candy is melting, no? White candy, like caramel. So this is another thing you can visit in Puebla. And once again, look, to the architecture, you can see the mix of the Talavera tiles and the red brick. Okay, so let's continue. And here, I'm gonna take you to see where else do we have in Puebla. We have a special area that we call the artist neighborhood. The artist neighborhood is an area where you will find the best painters of the city. You can walk you know, along this kind of corridor and you are gonna find little doors on the right side. Every door that you see here, it is a studio. And actually you see one of the artists here checking his phone. So basically this is a bohemian area where you can sit down and you can relax and have a coffee or you can read a book. 
And on the other side of the of this corridor, what you find is this. On the left side, I, I put this picture. This is a market that is called El Parian. And this market is where you can find everything. You can find all these souvenirs, all these Mexican handcrafts coming not only from Mexico, from, sorry, from Puebla, also coming from different regions of Mexico. And this is a very, very good spot to hang around. But also you can find uh, a, like uh, besides handcrafts, you can find a lot of food. Okay, so let's continue in our tour. We are already here in the Boulevard Cinco de Mayo. So what we are gonna do now is to go up. Uh, we are gonna go up to the hill. Look here down, I, I put this picture so you can see the, the mountain, no, I mentioned this mountain, the Malinche, and you can see how big is Puebla, no? You can see that only from here it is possible to reach like the end of the city. Another important uh, thing of Puebla is that uh, we are uh, a city that welcomes every year a lot of students. So we have a lot of universities, we have private universities, but also we have the public university. And that is why we have a lot of students for coming from different regions, not only from, from different countries, but also from Oaxaca, from Mexico City, from the North. And other thing that is important in our economical activity is the, uh, the car production. So since the 60s, we have Volkswagen here and we have other um, important uh, firmas no, that are also working together with them. So once we are here, I'm gonna show you how the ports look like. On the first uh, place, we have the Museum of the Non-Intervention or the Port of Loreto. This fort, it is uh, the, the best well-preserved fort because we have two, but basically this was best uh, well-preserved because the, the battle took place like at the entrance on the other side of the, of the hill. And what you can find here, it is a museum. This museum is open every day, except uh, Mondays. Now, because of the pandemic, we, we, don't, we cannot visit it right now, but usually it's open every day. And what you can find inside are a lot of things related with the battle Cinco de Mayo. So basically here is where we take kids no, to know more about this part of our history. You can see canyons, you can see the flags of Mexico, you can see also paintings, and you also can see personal belongings of these important characters. This uh, fort, before being a fort, it was a chapel. It was a chapel that was dedicated to Our Lady of Loreto. But then with the time, it was converted into a fort in the early 1800s. And thank God that they did that because after that we had the battles in Goyamayo. So this is just a little bit about the museum. And on the other side of the, of the hill, we are gonna find the Museum Fort of Guadalupe. This Fort of Guadalupe also was a chapel, but this chapel was dedicated first to Our Lady of Belen. And, when, and then with the time, it changed for Our Lady of Guadalupe. So basically both of them were small shrines, small chapels that were converted into forts. This fort is not as well as preserved, no? You can see on the, on the picture that also is kind of damaged. And remember, it was because mainly the battle took place on this side. Okay, so now let's talk about the Battle of Puebla. People also call the Battle of Cinco de Mayo, or they just say, let's celebrate Cinco de Mayo, but let, let be honest here, that's not the official name. The official name is the Battle of Puebla. And this is because it happened right here in Puebla. And of course, it took place on this day, May the 
5th. That's why it's more convenient no? to say Cinco de Mayo. What year was that? It was 1862. So before going into this, uh, all these uh, details, I thought it was convenient to talk about the background of what was going on in Mexico, what was going on in the 19th century, because when someone tells you about a battle and if you're not pretty sure what has to do with, it's like, uh, what's the sense? So I thought it was convenient to mention that at that time, Mexico was passing through a very, very hard times. So in the early uh, 19th century, in the 1800s, we started with the War of Independence, no? It was a, an important movement when Mexico wanted to be independent from Spain. So uh, many, many people were involved in this independence. And finally, after 1821, we were Mexico. We got our name, can you believe it? Because before that, we didn't have that name. Mexico was not Mexico at that time. Before the independence, Mexico was called the New Spain because we belonged to Spain. So after the independence is when now we are called Mexicans. And then a couple of years later or 20 years later, we had the invasion of North America. Oh no, another battle that happened from 1846 to 1848. What did it happen here? Well, another invasion. And at this time, in this moment, is when Mexico lost a big portion of its territory, to say the least, no? And after that, after some years, we have the War of Reform from 1857 to 1860. No, another battle, another war, but in this case, it was not against someone from the, from the outside. In this case, had to do with problems of Mexico, problems that we had here in our country. At that time, maybe you know that the church, the institution, was um, controlling everything. So this battle uh, or this war happened because Benito Juarez became the president the president of Mexico, he became the president in 1858. So what he did is to create a law. And this law basically was to separate the church from the state. So Benito said, no more, no more. We need to do something because it's not fair that you control everything and uh, it's, in, it's unfair. So that is why after all these battles and this things, Mexico came into a chaos. And after this chaos is when, when we thought things were gonna, going to be better, is when we have the Battle of Puebla, the Battle Cinco de Mayo in 1862. But before we explain the battle, it's important to understand what was happening. So this, um, the war of reform caused major disasters, as I mentioned. And through Mexican's economy, uh, and Benito Juarez was forced to suspend the payment of the foreign debts. Who were the creditors of Mexico? Well, in the first place, we had England. We owed England 69 million pesos from that time. That was a lot of money. On the second place, we had as our creditor uh, Spain and we owed 9 million to them. And on the third place, we have France. To France, we owed only 2 million, but still counted, no? So these guys, they knew or they heard that Benito didn't want to pay the debt because there was a chaos here. And well, that was not a very good thing for them. So basically what they did is to go to London and in London, they met in a convention that was named the London Convention. So basically what they did is to talk, no, to talk, have you heard what's going on in Mexico? Yes, and they are not gonna pay. So what do you think we should go to Mexico and we should ask for, 
for the for the money, no? And in this convention, they agreed they were gonna come, but they promised that they were not seeking the territory's acquisition. That was the first promise. And the second promise was that they were not getting involved in matters of internal Mexican politics. Okay, yeah, it seems to be not, uh, fair enough. And they decided to come to Mexico. And that was in 1861. In 1861, in December, the ships of the, of the Spanish and the ships of the English arrived to Veracruz. That was December. But they had to wait a little bit more to the French because the French were a little bit late. I don't know what was happening, but they came here early 1862 in January. When they came to Mexico, to Mexico, they disembarked in Veracruz. As I mentioned, Veracruz is right here on the Gulf of Mexico. And they, they were like expecting to talk with someone, no? But at that time, Benito Juarez was not gonna attend and was not gonna go to, to Veracruz to, to solve anything. So what he did is to send another man that was the Minister of the External Affairs. His name was Manuel Doblado. So Manuel Doblado, basically what he did is to try to convince these guys and ask them to go back. And he said, look guys, the problem here is not that we don't want to pay you. The problem is that we don't have money. So you must understand that we are gonna pay but it's just that it's not today. So why don't you go back? Why don't you relax? No, you can stay as long as you want, but please give us some time. And well, the French were like, mm, I don't think so. We had other intentions, but the Spanish and the English, they kind of accepted and they said, okay, okay, yeah, we are gonna, we are gonna withdraw only because you say so. And we give you two years and they withdraw. No, they withdraw back to Europe and also because they knew that making a war was gonna be even more expensive. So uh, they accepted the treatment, but not the French. The French always wanted to invade Mexico, no? And this man, Dubois de Saligny, was like the representative man of the French and he said, no, we are not gonna withdraw. We are here, we are not gonna go back. And this is a great opportunity to invade Mexico because this had to do with other intentions for a long, long time. And this had to do with the emperor of, of France. If you don't remember who was the emperor, the emperor of France was Napoleon, Napoleon III. So Napoleon III was uh, like conquering all around uh, the world. And you must know guys that at that time, the French had the best army of the world. So they were very well trained. They have a, a, an academy, academy for that. They had the best weapons. They had the best people. So we were gonna fight against the best army. So it was not a piece of cake, right? And on the side of the French, we had another important man that was the General Charles Latrie. The general was famous for being the Count of Lorences. This man was in charge of all this uh, army. And you know, he knew that the battle was gonna be something easy because this French expeditionary was led by a, well, this expeditionary man was very well trained and he already was in, in Africa. So he had a lot of skills and from Africa, they also brought other people who were called the swaps. The swaps that also came from Argelia. So imagine, no? imagine how it was at that time, the fear that had everybody here in Mexico, the, the French were coming inside. So it was not easy. Okay, and here we must talk about how was the relationship with, between Mexico and the United States. 
So I consider that this was important to mention, no? And what you must know here is that at that time, the president of the United States was Abraham Lincoln. So Abraham Lincoln somehow understood Benito Juarez and somehow also supported Benito Juarez. People say he sent money and also he sent some weapons to help Benito because also he knew that it was not convenient to have the French in Mexico because who knows, maybe after Mexico, they were gonna go back to, to, the, state, to the United States and invade the United States. So they were living kind of parallel lives. And if you are interested of knowing more about this, you can reach out a book that is called Abraham Lincoln and Mexico, written by Michael Hogan. And this book is gonna tell you more of this relationship between Benito Juarez and Abraham Lincoln. So, but there is a fun fact here that I realized some uh, weeks ago when I, went, I was looking for pictures. And the fun fact is that they still uh, uh, share these parallel lives. These people, these men, we see them every day or almost every day. Today, we can find Benito in the 500 bill and Abraham is in the $5 bill. So I call them the five, the, the men of the five bills, no? If you want to call it like that. So it's just a fun fact. So, okay. So going back again to the history, we have to mention who was on the side of the Mexicans. And in this case, uh, the most important character of the battle is going to be the General Ignacio Zaragoza. So the General Ignacio Zaragoza, he was born in, a, not in what is today Mexico, he was born in Espiritu Santo Bay in Texas. He was uh, the son of another important man who was also part of the army. So somehow he already knew how to deal with these battles. And he was uh, the man that took charge of the battle, no? Because there wasn't any other better man like him, no? Who was young because he was 32 years old and also he was kind of experienced. So Ignacio Zaragoza, he, what he did is to go to Veracruz. He tried to go to Veracruz and reached the, the, France, the French, but he didn't know what to expect. So suddenly on the way, he found the French and there was a, a small battle, no? And in this moment, he's gonna realize that the, the, the French were very, very well prepared. So what he decided is to get, withdraw and go back to Puebla. So what he planned is that it was not convenient to fight in Veracruz. It was more convenient to prepare the strategy to call the Mexican army. And after that, of course, to expect and wait for the, for the French and perhaps they were gonna be lucky. So they came to Puebla and in Puebla, of course, they were not alone. Of course, there were many, many, many brave men who were in this battle, no? Like these guys that you see now, the pictures of Porfirio Diaz, Felipe Berriozabal, Francisco La Madrid, Manuel Negrete, no? The battle wouldn't work without all these people. So once they were here in Puebla, they organized the different battalions, no? The different groups. And thanks to this strategy is that they, they could catch the French. So what you see on the map basically is the Fort of Loreto on one side of the hill and the Fort of Guadalupe here. So the French were coming from this side and the first fort they found was the Fort of Guadalupe. So the, only, the other thing that we have to know and we cannot forget is that the Mexicans, the Mexicans were part of this ba uh, battle, but Mexicans who came from the indigenous areas, from little towns like Tetela de Ocampo, Xochiapulco, Zacapuaxtla, but basically from Tetela de Ocampo, which is now an important place to visit, it's a small town. And these guys, they were very, very brave because many of them 
they never took a weapon in their hands. So they, this was the first time they were defeating the nation, they were defeating the territory. So basically some of them, as you can see in this recreation, because it's from a movie, they were in sandals. They didn't have boots, no, look to this man. And they were having some of them machetes. It's the only thing they have at that time because of course in Mexico, we didn't have money for weapons. So this is very, very important to mention that we never forget that the, the battle, in the battle, we have a lot of heroes. Once they were here, close to Puebla, the General Zaragoza, what he did is to go inside a church, the Lady of the Remedies. He knew that he couldn't lose this battle. It was very important, first of all, to be in contact with the president, and second, he couldn't die. So because he knew he had to be like, in, in charge. So basically he went and he took this church as a base. And from here, he was sending all the messages to the field and also to the president. And on the left side, you can see just a painting of how supposed to be the battle. The battle started on May the 5th, very early in the morning. And well, there were different attacks from the French and there was a big mistake, a big mistake that uh, the French did. The, mis the mistake that the French did was that they underestimate the Mexican army. No? I think that if the Mexicans also won the, the battle is because French were very confident. It's like, no, I have enough weapons. I have enough um, ammunition. So one of the th things that happened in the field is that after three attacks, the, the French ran out of ammunition. And then there was a, a storm. So the conditions of the weather, the conditions of not having enough uh, ammunition made the French to realize that they were losing more men than Mexicans. And of course, after the Mexicans started attacking and attacking is when they are gonna withdraw and they are gonna regret of their words and they are gonna go away, slowly go away back to Veracruz. So that's why we celebrate and we feel so um, proud of this day, no? because nobody thought that the Mexicans were gonna win and nobody thought that people with machetes were gonna fight against the best uh, army of the world. So in this painting, you can see how it was. You now you can see the Mexican landscape. You can see the, this agaves, no? And you can see that uh, they, they are kind of losing the battle, no? You can see the swaps. The swaps are with this red uh, kind of pants, no? And the others are French who had to escape and go back. So after this battle, there were an important man, there was an important man that maybe you're gonna uh, find his picture if you come to Mexico and was Porfirio Diaz. I'm not gonna talk too much about Porfirio Diaz because also it's another part of the history. But what you have to know is that Porfirio Diaz became the president of Mexico, no? After this moment also he was recognized as, as one of the most important characters. And years later, no? 1910, he was gonna be the president, but unfortunately he was gonna be a dictator of the country. And he was gonna be involved in another important battle that was the revolution of Mexico, no? Okay, so going back again to the, to the story, uh, what people don't know after the French went back to, to Veracruz, people don't know that they never went back to France the French stayed in Veracruz. So the French, they didn't surrender as maybe we would uh, believe. The French were hoping and were waiting for more people to come because they wanted to bring the last emperor. So what they did is to wait, to wait a couple of months in Veracruz. And when they were ready, when nobody expected, they came to Puebla again 
that now in this moment, they knew how it was the territory. And then they have another important battle against the, the Mexicans. And this is what we call the site of Puebla, El Sitio de Puebla. And after they won this important day, they brought the last emperor of Mexico, which is Maximilian. So Maximilian was gonna be the last emperor of Mexico. He was gonna come in 1864, but unfortunately the story must continue. That's another part of the history that I hope to tell you in the future. And uh, well, if you want to know more about Cinco de Mayo, there is a movie that also you can watch. It's called Cinco de Mayo, La Batalla. So this is what has to do with the battle Cinco de Mayo. And well, today, what do we do today to celebrate Cinco de Mayo? Well, there are some differences between the United States and Mexico because Mexico has the independence day. So the day that we use to celebrate, to drink margaritas and to have such a big party is the independence, no? The independence that was the 15th of September. But today what we do is an important uh, parade. It's a big parade that uh, goes all along the Boulevard Cinco de Mayo and uh, in it has, been for a long time one of the most important parades, not only in Puebla, also in the in the country. Unfortunately, because of the of the COVID, the pandemic, this year we couldn't have our parade. But it's impressive, no? Sometimes we have the president of Mexico coming here, the governor of Puebla, the everybody is there, and uh, the navy, the army, the helicopters, the soldiers, they come because they know that this, this day is unforgettable to the history of Mexico and especially the history of Puebla. And on the other hand, well, it doesn't matter if you are with us, we like you very much. And we are very, very happy that also this day has passed through the uh, American history because both the, uh, in both countries, you know, in Mexico and in the States, the most important thing is that it has created an identity, an identity of being Mexican, an identity of being Latino, and an identity of being uh, independent and having our own rules. So this would be what is about Cinco de Mayo. Cheers. If you have your drinks, please cheer with me. So we are back into our map. And now we want to go to downtown what are we going to find in this area in this area i'm going to take you to know a little bit more of the flavors of mexico and especially of puebla uh, in this picture what do you see you see a convent right you see a convent imagine the life at that time the nuns were a uh, very, very skilled for cooking, and especially because they have enough time, and also because they have um, like access to to buy ingredients. So this um, this kitchen is very famous nowadays. Also, it's a museum, and it's called the Museum or the Kitchen of Santa Rosa. What you see here on the left side is these big pots, no, or in Spanish cazuelas, because what we prepare or what they prepare here was the mole poblano. The mole poblano has a very nice story. Of course, this maybe is a legend, but they say that one day the nuns, they went or they attend to a service. And one day uh, in these preaches of the priest, one of them was very inspired because the priest told them that the Mexicans, they were now a mix a mix of Europeans or Spanish and especially Poblanos and a mix of indigenous people. So this nun, Sor Andrea, she went to the kitchen, grabbed some things or different ingredients from the pantry. And she found that there were a lot of ingredients coming from Europe or maybe from Asia, no? Like cloves, sesame seed, cinnamon, and a lot of spices. And from Mexico, she took the most representative that was tomato, chiles, and uh, chocolate. 
And after that, she started grinding and grinding all these ingredients for a long, 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 long time. And she got to this recipe that everybody loved. And today we call mole poblano. The mole poblano looks like a paste, no? Because remember, you have to grind all these ingredients. If you want to go through the traditional way, you have this, this uh, stone, the metate. And after you grind everything, you use this cazuela and you add a little bit of chicken broth or water, whatever you have, and you get the mole. The mole is something that I love, and you know why? Because mole doesn't discriminate. Mole is a dish that we can find in very humble families, on the street, in very, very, very local uh, stands, but also the mole is found at the very fancy restaurants. And the mole usually goes with some rice. So you can see always women are preparing mole from that time. Then I'm gonna talk about the chile nogada. Another important dish that is famous in Puebla is the chile en nogada. Why is famous in Puebla? Because of the poblano pepper. So now you know that everything that is poblano has to do with Puebla. In Puebla, we grow these peppers that are called poblanos and the season is coming now in June, July, August and September. And in these days is when we prepare this delicious uh, chile that is gonna be stuffed with picadillo. And after that, we are gonna cover with this uh, cream or this walnut sauce with pomegranate and a leaf of uh, coriander. So if you know our flag of Mexico, these are the colors of the Mexican flag. And it's uh, stuffed with a, pica a picadillo that has to do with fruits and also meat, so it's delicious. And also if you come to Puebla, you can come and visit a fair, the fair of the Chile Nogada that usually is in Calpan. Calpan is a very small village close to the fields of the poblano peppers. So that must be in your list. Okay, but what else do we have in Puebla? We have tacos and not any kind of tacos. I know that uh, tacos are very famous all around the world, but only in Puebla you find the Arabian tacos. The Arabian tacos have to do with the kebabs. You are right, they look like kebabs, like shawarmas. And this is because in our history also, we had some people coming from Iraq and then they brought the idea of the pit, this pit that you see on the picture. But instead of a lamb, we use pork because at that time also, and still today is very expensive, no, lamb. So it was changed for pork. And with, of course, with a Mexican touch, it was converted into a Mexican taco because the tortilla looks like a pita bread. But in this case, the tortilla is not a tortilla made out of corn. It is a tortilla made out of flour, a flour tortilla like the burritos. So that must be on your list if you come to Puebla. Look how they are not cooked with gas, they are cooked with charcoal. So the meat has a very special flavor, very smoky flavor. And the meat is uh, marinated with oregano, parsley, onion, and garlic. So very simple, but delicious. And of course, they are served in a dish like this with lime, because we eat everything with lime in Mexico. Many people put lime into the soup. And next to us always is the, the Mexican sauce, a hot sauce, because in Mexico we say that if, if, si no pica, no sabe. If it's not spicy, it doesn't taste. So that's number three that must be in your list. In our list, we also have another dish that is called the semita poblana. The semita poblana, let me tell you guys that the best semitas is at the market. If you go to the markets of Mexico, you always find the best food. And here in Puebla, there is no market without semitas. Semitas basically is a bread that you can see here on the right. It's a kind of bread that is varnished with some uh, melazas, that's why I have this color. And then they add some sesame seed, it's very crunchy and has just a little bit of yeast, water and flour. 
And the semitas are for a day when you don't want to cook or it's a, a dish that you find at the soccer stadium or it's a dish a sandwich that you find at the wrestlings. So the semita usually has as a plant, an edible plant that is called papalo. This makes a semita. And this is something that you are not gonna find that uh, often in other parts of Mexico. So if you are in Puebla, you must try it. it gives a very special uh, flavor to your semita. And also semitas go with cheese, string cheese from, from Oaxaca or string cheese is what we call it. And of course, avocado. And of course, any kind of pepper that can be the rajas or the chipotles, no? So it's a sandwich that is very healthy and the extra can be uh, breaded meat. In this case, could be chicken or it could be pork. Then we have the chalupas. The chalupas, which is also one of my favorites. And this is a dish that you find very often at night. This food is for people who are not scared to, to the grease, not to the fat, because as you can see, uh, they are deep fried, tortillas deep fried into lard with just a little bit of onion and just a little bit of meat. And usually you get five or 10 of these small tortillas and you cannot only eat one. So you must eat more than two. And after that, after eating all this, this food, I'm gonna take you to the candy street. That is for dessert. That's gonna be our last part of the tour. And this street is very famous in Puebla because most of the, the business or these uh, people that you find here, they only sell candy or sweets. It's not the candy that we put into the piñatas. It's a different candy. And it's not only for foreigners or it's not only for tourists, also it's for poblanos because we love sweets. One of the candies that you find in, in these stores is the, the pumpkin seed roosters. Look how beautiful, this is art. It's like if you were eating art and colorful, only in Mexico you can eat colors. So these are little, little pieces that are made out of pumpkin. The other uh, delicious candy that you find is the sweet potato. The bar that you find here, it is only sweet potato, no? And next to it, we have cookies that also are very famous in Puebla that are called Tortitas de Santa Clara. And they are famous because of the glaze is made out with pumpkin. In the center of Mexico, we consume a lot of pumpkin. And after that, if you want to go farther, you can find or you can ask for the borrachitos. Borrachitos or little drunk because they are made with some alcohol. In this case, it could be tequila, mezcal, or eggnog, or whatever. Or if you are into coconut, you can find these delicious uh, little pieces of coconut. So basically, the candy uh, street has a long list. It would be impossible to talk about all these candy, and it's impossible to try all of them, but at least now you know a little bit of this candy. And for saying goodbye, I brought you this uh, last picture that is a shot, a shot and a bar that is very, very famous in Puebla. This bar is called La Pasita. La Pasita means racing, the racing. And what you can find there, it is a, a shot, no, you see the man serving directly from the bottle, uh, is this one. It's a beverage that is very, very sweet because it's made with raisins. So uh, what they do is to serve it in a, in a shot and they are gonna put into the shot a little piece of, cake, of, of cheese, goat cheese. So what you're gonna do is to bite the cheese and then sip the pasita and then you're gonna balance the flavor and that's gonna be a very, very good uh, option for finishing your tours in Puebla. And especially in this important day, if you are not into sweet uh, beverages, don't worry, you can also ask for this other uh, shot or you can find for the charro, you can find any other shot or any other liquor uh, that is on your taste. So this is 
I'm sorry, but this is the end. I must say thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much for coming today to our tour, for visiting Puebla, even in this distance. I am very, very happy that you feel motivated and I hope that you come to Puebla. Please, please call me if you are in Puebla. My name is Alejandra. You can find me as Vivencias Mexico. I am in Puebla, but I am also in Mexico City. And thank you, thank you so much once again. Well, thank you, Alejandra. This was awesome. I think it was a perfect mix of history, um, cuisine, culture, and I really appreciated. Thankfully, I ate dinner already, but I know a lot of you still have not put your Cinco de Mayo menu to to together. So now you have it. I have shared the PDF that Alejandra um, prepared for us, which was five ways to celebrate Cinco de Mayo. I put it in the chat and I also put it on Facebook. I will also add it to our website when we put up the recording. So you'll be able to access that as well. Um, Alejandra, I can't thank you enough for sharing everything you know about Mexico. At, well, actually Puebla, your city with us. Um, I think that many people came here not knowing really what the significance of Cinco de Mayo was. So I, I think that we all appreciate the history and we have a much deeper understanding for your city now. So thank you. Um, if you're ready and if you want to take a drink of water or something before we get started, you certainly can. But we were going to go to the Q&A at this point. And what you can do is open the Q&A from the bottom toolbar. You can take yourself off mute and then we'll go to the top of it and we'll try to address as many questions as possible. Yes, I'm happy to answer all these questions. So I have here, home of Clase Azul. Clase Azul, I, I'm not sure what you mean, Clase Azul. I mean, I, we have a, a, a hotel that is called a, has to do with Azul, but I'm not really sure what you mean, Clase Azul, if you can write it again. How far is Puebla from the F or Mexico City? It's not too, too far, only two hours, and that would be 120 kilometers, very, very close. How many districts are there in Mexico? We have 32 states, only 32. <laughs> What is the name of the active volcano mentioned first? The, uh, it's a good question. That is Popo Catepetu. Popo Catepetu. <laughs> Next question. What is the local dialect? I hosted an exchange student from Puebla and she said her family speaks a local dialect. Well, you know, we have different local dialects. We have the Nahuatl, but also, if you go to the north, you can find Totonac, and you can also find people in the south that speak Popoloc. So basically, we have three, but the most important is Nahuatl. Is it open for travelers? What are the COVID uh, precautions? Yes, uh, now the government of Mexico is so, uh, well said that everybody can come to Mexico, of course, with certain uh, restrictions. But Puebla is open for travelers. We don't have all museums open. We don't have all archaeological sites open, but it's possible to come and see and have a good time. Uh, who colonized your city? Well, the Spanish. The Spanish came to, to Puebla. Basically, it was a group of people who came after the conquest. The conquest of Mexico was in in 1524, Mexico City, and just some years later, they came to Puebla, 1531. How old is the city of Puebla? Well, uh, I have to make counts, but almost 500 years, no? Because I mentioned uh, they founded Puebla, 1531. What year was the Falafoxian Library established? That was in uh, 1646. 1646 was the, the year when they uh, opened the library, not as we see it today. No, the, the building has passed through changes, but it was in 1646. Another question, is Puebla where they also celebrate the Day of the Dead in November or is it somewhere else in Mexico? Oh yeah, one of my favorite days 
in Puebla would be Dia de Muertos, the Day of the Dead. I must say that uh, here close to our city, we have two towns that are famous for building these huge altars for Dia de Muertos. So these names are Huaquechula and uh, Tochimilco. And I highly, highly recommend to come to Puebla and see these traditions. Have the library books been scanned so that there are online copies available for research? Yes, I mean, not available for researchers. You must have a permission, but of course they have been scanned. And these documents of course are in, in different parts, no? Uh, they are not very accessible for security reasons. Another question, how was the Palafoxian library being modernized to function as a contemporary library? Or it is just an interesting museum. As a contemporary library, we cannot really say it is a library, an open lab library. I mean, it is for researchers, but once again, you need a permission, you need a, like a PDH or PhD or being studying. Otherwise, they won't uh, allow you to, to read or to have access to the acquire. Uh, the town seems well planned. Yeah, thank you. Yes, from the start and very well constructed. The cathedral and fortress are very impressive as well. Was there a reason the city was located and built where it is? Yes, they, they found a place for, for the cathedral that wasn't too close to the river. In the very beginning, I showed you a map and I showed you there was a river. So they have to be, be very careful with the, with the church. So they chose a very good spot. And actually, if you go to the cathedral, they even built like a, like a pedestal, can we say, because it is in a higher level, the cathedral. Next question. And was the layout of the city grid system planned? Yes, of course, uh, being a Spanish city, they brought new technology, new plans, very different things that uh, were not considered by the Mesoamericans. Well, I cannot say Mesoamericans didn't have a plan for cities, but in a different way. So of course there was a plan. How safe is it to travel to this area with or without a tour? I would be very sure that is safe to come to Puebla, no? Uh, especially because, yeah, it's a touristy place. So I think uh, in Puebla, we are always very happy to have all of you and that would be safe. When they changed the name from New Spain to Mexico, what made them choose the name of Mexico? Was there a meaning to that word? Very good question. After the independence, they didn't know how to call our nation. So uh, maybe you have heard about the Aztecs, right? The Aztecs were in Mexico City and the Aztecs were uh, in a city that was called Mexico Tenochtitlan. That was the original name of the capital, Mexico Tenochtitlan. And since the Aztecs were considered one of the most important groups, they say, okay, maybe Mexico, Mexico, we can take this part of our uh, natives and they, they came with this name for the, for the country. You mentioned the division of Puebla early. The left side was the Spanish side on, and the right side was the indigenous people. When you say indigenous were these Mayans, Aztec or a different group? No, they were not Mayans because Mayans were only in the south of Mexico but we have people coming from the surroundings. So we have people here that were called Cholultecas, no? Or we have people coming from Tlaxcala, Tlaxcaltecas. So in Mexico, we have a big group of uh, indigenous uh, people, so ethnic groups, can we say. So it was not only Mayas and Aztecs, there were more, and they were around the, the territory of Puebla. You mentioned the names of the volcanoes. You talked about were not Spanish. What language were the names from? Nahuatl. Uh, Nahuatl, which is uh, still spoken in, in Mexico. And basically this language is spoken only in central Mexico because if you go to the south, 
they don't speak la uh, uh, this language, they speak only Maya. When is the best time to visit Puebla? Very good question. I could say any time. We have such a perfect weather that if you come in December, it's not that cold. If you come now in May, it's not too hot because we have uh, sometimes rain. Maybe if you come in between June and July, you would find rain because that would be the rainy season. But you don't have to worry because our rain only lasts for one hour and that's it. <laughs> uh, best places to shop. Well, that, that's a hard question because I would say that it depends. It depends what you are looking for. If you are looking for souvenirs, el parian, no? But if you are looking for pottery, I would recommend to go to these uh, famous houses, no? For Talavera. Or if you go, you, if you want to find embroidery, I would recommend to go to the north side of Puebla and you can find uh, better prices and of course, very, very beautiful things. Do you have language immersion tours? Well, yes, uh, I have worked with some students, uh, especially coming from Oklahoma. So uh, once in a while I work with them and it's always, always a pleasure to have them here because also uh, the tours are different. They also want to know more about the daily life. So yes, 23 plus ingredients, verdad? I guess you are talking about the mole. Yes, the mole has a lot of ingredients, uh, but you can, you can prepare mole from five, six ingredients, no? My mother has a secret recipe and actually I sent to you the recipe because it's very easy to do. And also because I'm sure that uh, nobody's gonna get sick because mole can be very heavy for the amount of uh, ingredients. I just had mole poblano enchiladas for dinner, delicious. Yes, it's a very good option, enchiladas. What is the sauce on the chile poblano and are palm grapes grown in Mexico? Yes, the sauce is a walnut, walnut sauce, um, and the palm grape is uh, grown, yes. I mean, it is not originally from here, but now we grow it and also in the same area of the poblano peppers. La pasita means what? I didn't understand. Oh, sorry, sometimes my, my accent is very Mexican, but pasita means raisin. Little raisin, no, pasa, raisin. Raisin. Pasa, raisin, that would be the, the meaning. How far is Cuernavaca from Puebla and what is there to see? Well, I could say that everywhere you go, there is something to see, like the palace, the palace of Hernán Cortés, that will be an important museum. And it's not that far, but if you are driving, that would be more than three hours. So the best way to go to Cuernavaca, in my opinion, is from Mexico City. It's closer from Mexico City than from Puebla. Can we buy mole poblano in the United States? Of course, yes. I'm sure that if you go to the Mexican groceries, you can find mole poblano, the paste, yes. Please give us the names of good restaurants in Puebla. We did not find a good one in the five days. Oh, why? Well, it depends also what you want to eat, no? As I mentioned, if you are looking more for street food, my opinion is to go to the market and to taquerias, to stands. But if you look more for uh, dishes, more complex dishes, I recommend El Mural de los Poblanos, uh, Casa Reina, for example, Casa Barroca. So I could uh, maybe pass a list to Mara. Uh, maybe Mara can share it with you now for those who are interested in knowing more about restaurants. Would, best, would the best place to stay be near the Zócalo? Is everything within walking distance? Yes, in my opinion, always is the best place to stay. The only thing that you have to be aware of is that very early in the morning, you always listen to the bells, <laughs> especially on Sundays. So if you don't want to wake up very early with the ring uh, sound, 
maybe you can stay not that close to the cathedral. But for me, yes, and it, everything is very, very close to walk. To walk. Uh, are there ruins nearby? Yes, the archaeological site of Cholula. Cholula has the largest pyramid of the world. It was covered and is the one that you are seeing right now in front of the volcano. So that church that is yellow under the church is not a hill, it is a pyramid. And that is the pyramid of Cholula. But my favorite uh, archeological site in Puebla, that would be Cantona. Cantona is only two hours or less than two hours and it's, it's different, but it's, it's a big archeological site. Another question, are there many iguanas in Puebla like there are in Cancun? No, we don't have iguanas here because I, I think they are more for high heat. They don't like our weather. Our, our weather is more like, not cold, but we, we say fresh, it's a fresh weather. So they don't like this weather. We are going to Puebla in October for Day of the Dead. What special festivity celebration are occurring at that time? <clears throat> well, uh, today or this year, I'm not pretty sure how it's gonna be, but uh, usually we have a lot of altars. We have open museums and every museum has an altar. And also we have a parade of Katrinas. And usually you can go to these two villages around uh, Puebla. But the last year, it was not possible because of the restrictions of the pandemic. So still we don't have the information, but I'm sure that if you come, you can see decoration. No, you can really feel like how is the mood while Dia de Muertos. Are there still tile makers in Puebla? I remember touring a small factory. Yes. Yeah, we still have a lot of these places to visit and some of them are very famous. You can see the process from, from scratch, basically, no? And you can see the artists, how they are painting. So this is also another tour I recommend to go to the Talavera factory. Could you tell us again why Mexico didn't have the money to pay its debts to England, Spain and France? because of all these battles and because also the power of the Catholic institution, no? Remember that they were controlling basically at that time everything and uh, well, they got into debt and that's why they, there wasn't any money for paying. I believe somebody asked about Casa Azul. Ah, okay, Casa Azul, Frida Kahlo, yeah. No, Frida Kahlo is not here in Puebla. Frida Kahlo House is in Mexico City. And that is in Coyoacán, in the south of Mexico City. But it's not too far. <laughs> what airport would you fly into coming to visit Pueblo and Mexico City? The, the airport of, Mexi of Puebla is the airport Hermano Cerdán. That's the name. Uh, but we don't have that many connections to all parts of the United States. If you don't find a, a connection, the only connection I know is from Houston, for example, from Texas, we have different connections. But if you are in another part, I recommend you to fly directly into Mexico City, the airport Benito Juarez, that's the name. Could you please repeat the name of the green leaves in the Semitas? Sure, yes, it is called Papalo, papalo, hard, but, but very delicious. No, hard to remember, but it has to do with a native language also and comes from papalotl. Papalotl means butterfly. So the leaf has the shape of a butterfly and that's why we call it papalo. Do you visit uh, Talavera ceramic store. Yes, I mean, when people request to come and they are interested in to seeing this process, of course, we take them to uh, the Talavera ceramic store or to the Ta Talavera ceramic factory. We have different options. If we are in Cholula, we go to one in Cholula, but if we are in Puebla, we go to one in Puebla. Which side of the river to stay at when visiting Puebla? And is their architecture different? Good question also. Yes, the architecture today is very different. 
because on the side of the indigenous people, we don't have these big houses or casonas. We don't have fountains. We don't have uh, the same architecture, but it doesn't mean it's not nice. The thing is that we don't have too many hotels because when you come to Puebla, most of the hotels are in these casonas. So if you want to go on the other side of the river, there is a, a famous hotel that is called Casa Reina and they, they have a nice space there and you can have the feeling of the other side of the river. And also you can go to the market to find some semitas. I have heard there are beautiful ruins of convents and monasteries near the mountains at Puebla. Can those be toured? Yes. Yes, we have so many things in Puebla and in the state that it will be impossible to talk about it, but sure, we have a lot of Franciscan convents. Some of them are around the volcano because the Franciscans came and settled down where the native people were. Remember that they had to evangelize the indigenous people and they had to teach them how to speak Spanish. So you can visit this route or route uh, close to the volcano, but we have another uh, area not too far from Veracruz on the way to Veracruz that is famous for having three or four important convents, in this case, monasteries, because they were for men. Uh, were there ceremonies near the volcano near Puebla? Ceremonies, uh, yes. I mean, I don't know if you mean like if today people go up to the volcano, but there is an important ceremony held every year. And indigenous people who live close to the volcano in the last town, uh, they climb the volcano, which is not allowed, of course, but they, they trust the volcano because the volcano is sacred for them. And they bring offerings to the volcano. The volcano has a name, and the name is Don Goyo. So they think that if they come every year and they bl are blessed by the volcano, it's gonna be a good year. And especially because the volcano always is smoking. So you never know when he's gonna make like a small explosion, no, so far so good. But yes, this is one of the most important ceremonies that people do for the volcano. <laughs> Thank you so much, amazing presentation. Thank you guys. Uh, what are other towns or natural spots to visit near Puebla? Good question. We have a biosphere reserve that is called Tehuacán, Huicatlán, and that would be in the south of the state towards Oaxaca. So between, between Oaxaca and Puebla, we have this famous place because we have endemic flora, which is cactus, cacti, cacti, basically and famous um, yeah, fauna, no? some of these also are endemic. So that would be highly, highly recommended if you are into, into natural spaces and especially like going out of the city. How much time should you plan for visiting Puebla? Well, uh, people come usually here for, for two days. I mean, it depends also what you want to do. Uh, but I consider that if you plan for five days, uh, you are not gonna uh, get bored because you are always gonna find something to do. And if it's not inside the city, you can always visit the surroundings and you can visit something that we call Pueblos Magicos. Pueblos Magicos are the magical towns and they are called magical because they still preserve these traditions and language and embroiderings and beautiful landscape. So I would say that if you plan for four days, that would be excellent, no? I went to Universidad de las Americas in Cholula in 1971. Is it safe to go back and visit? Of course, of course, yes. I'm happy to know that. It has changed a lot from, from the 70s. Now Cholula is not a little town anymore, but but yeah, I, I think it would be a good idea to come back and see how it is. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, crazy Canadians swim in hotel hot springs. Sulphur Springs, I think. 
it was in January, but we love it. I love a lovely city. Are the three mountains ranged, ranges still called the Three Sisters? No, no, they are not really Three Sisters because um, some of the mountains are called, um, are considered females and uh, some other mountains are considered masculine. I know it sounds crazy, why? But La Malinche, is like fe feminine, la malinche, the one that was on the north. Iztaccíhuatl also is feminine. Popocatépetl is masculine, and Pico de Orizaba is masculine. Why? I don't know, it has to do with the legend and also has to do with the cosmovision of the indigenous people at that time, but they are not the three sisters. Uh, what is your recommendation to avoid problem with the altitude? Well, I think that if you come to Puebla, straight to Puebla, and that day you want to hike on the mountains or the pyramid, that is not gonna work. So as, as far as you are the first day in the city, the first day and you just take it slow, you no, know, like you just hang around and maybe just walk a little bit, you don't have any problem. Problems are the when people land directly and as soon as they land, they want to go up to the volcano or they want to climb a lot of stairs and they want to climb the, the pyramid of Cholula. But I don't think you, you have any problem with the altitude. Uh, I mean Mayan or Aztec ceremonies near the volcano. Yeah, no, I mean, yes, it's an indigenous ceremony, but it's not anymore Mayan or Aztec is more the indigenous that has to do with the local people that live close to the volcano. Uh, do you know if there is a relationship between Manila and Puebla? Yes, since the Spanish ruled both for centuries of the same period. Of course, yes, we have a very strong uh, connection. And well, there wasn't too much time to tell you, but uh, we have a lot of uh, people coming from Asia in the 1600s. And one of the most important people or characters who came was a woman. This woman is called La China Poblana. I hope to have a, next, uh, a, future, a chance in the future to tell you the story. But yes, we have a strong uh, relationship from uh, this part of the history. Uh, what is the cost of living in Puebla, Mexico? Well, it depends. <laughs> It depends what you mean, no? Like if you want to know how much you pay for, well, my husband told me the other day that if you want to know how is the cost of life, you can look for the, the price of the club sandwich. And with the club sandwich cost, you can realize if it's too expensive or it's not too expensive. So a club sandwich would be 120 pesos in a, in a restaurant, in a hotel. That would be maybe like seven dollars, <laughs> no less. I could say six, five dollars. For example, a, 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 a cup of coffee that would be only one box. So I could say that in compared to other cities of Mexico, Puebla is not expensive. Uh, it's more expensive to live in Mexico City. Rent is more expensive in Mexico City. Puebla is still an affordable uh, place to to live and of course to visit, no? Uh, how many religions are, ah, sorry, I missed one. Is there transportation from Mexico City to Puebla? Yes, we have a lot of buses coming every day, coming and going back to Mexico City. Uh, how many religious religions are practiced in Mexico? Many, many. I mean, even if we are mainly Catholic, no, or if for many years the religion was Catholic, uh, the religions that are in Mexico are, I would say, all of them or most of them, no, especially in Mexico City. Uh, the Jews are also important. Uh, here in Puebla, you also you find people that are uh, agnostic or Mormon. So religions are I think as the same in, in many other countries. Uh, where are Cholutecos, Choltecas originally from? Well, they, the name was Olmeca Xicalanca. That was the original name, 
And then with the time, we had another group coming that were the Chichen Ix, and the Chichen Ix were coming from the north of Mexico. But since they were here for a long, long time, people changed the name for Cholultecas. So basically, when we say Cholultecas, it means they are from this spot, from this region. Um, next question, is Talavera made in the pottery district on the east side of the river? Yes, it was, there was uh, different areas because, you know, at that time, they also had to take out the, the how do you call it, the, um, the moth, not the mud, but the, for making the, the pottery, all these minerals, no? And they, it was not exactly from the city. So basically from the surroundings, they took the materials and the minerals. Um, I am an avid hiker. I am very interested in the local mountains to go hiking. Can you name some? Yes, uh, the Popocatépetl is one of them, but this one is not allowed to climb. What you have to do is to come to Puebla and from Puebla uh, you hire a car and you go directly to the park, the national park, and there is a spot between the Popo and the other mountain that is the Iztaccíhuatl. So the only mountain you can hike is the Iztaccíhuatl. And from the Iztaccíhuatl, you can have a beautiful view from the Popocatépetl, of the Popocatépetl. <laughs> uh, how young do the exchange students need to be in order to do a program? Well, the, the students usually are, um, in Mexico, what I know is uh, above 18, 19, but I mean, it depends. It depends on the, on the university or yeah, on the program. I guess you can have older students or younger students. And we also have a, a, a school for learning Spanish here in Puebla. Uh, excellent tour, thank you. Could you go in only spoke English? I mean, yes, you can come without a problem if you don't speak Spanish, but um, yeah, many people don't speak English like on the street. If you want to ask for tacos, I'm sure that you won't have any problem because you only are gonna point and I'm sure that Mexicans know about this language with hands and everything. So there's no problem. Can you rent a small vehicle to travel on own? Of course, yes, yes. In Mexico City, you can rent a car or here in Puebla or in Oaxaca. If you are landing in Oaxaca, from Oaxaca, you can come to Puebla. Which city has better food, Oaxaca or Puebla? Oh, that's a tough one. Okay, for me, <laughs> Puebla, of course, because I am Poblana, but it doesn't mean Oaxaca doesn't have good food. It's just that in Puebla, I think we have a large variety of things, no? Not only moles, we also have chalupas, tortas, tacos. And in, in Oaxaca, they are famous for having other kind of food like tlayudas, and moles, mole amarillito, etc. Any place to go swimming or to cool off? How far away? Well, um, the option that we could uh, give you is to go to some of the little towns on the north side of Puebla, because in there we have a lot of cascades. Uh, but in Puebla, it's not exactly famous for, for cooling off. I mean, basically it's more a city for culture or for hiking if you want to go around, no? But that's a good question. Maybe let me think about a place that you can visit for that. If we buy pottery, there can they ship it home for us or do we need to take it with us? Yes, they, they ship it for you. Uh, it depends on the, the company, but of course, they, they will do it for you. I use it, I used to live and study in La UAP, in Puebla. I love Puebla and it's my dream to go back. Wow, you came to Puebla as well. Very, very good. 
I'm so happy to read that many people have been here before. I am vegan. Is it easy to find vegan food restaurants in Puebla? I mean, it's not the common, no? still we need to open more vegan restaurants, but I have a colleague who, who is vegan. So um, as far as I know, she knows places around Puebla and in Cholula, especially in Cholula, you can find different uh, places. And I guess in Mexico, if you, want, if you go to the market, you always find uh, options, no? a lot of fruit, a lot of vegetables that I'm sure you would like to try and a lot of corn. We have a lot of uh, things that are vegetarian. Sometimes we don't realize that we can be very vegetarian. And I know it's not the same as vegan, but uh, I'm sure you can find vegan food. How is the infrastructure, such as water purity and waste processing in Puebla? Well, the infrastructure uh, in general is considered good, no? I mean, we have hospitals, we have a lot of universities, and this has to do with the size of the city uh, and the waste. Well, of course, uh, sometimes people tell me that they are surprised to see that the historic center is one of the cleanest they have seen in Mexico. Uh, I feel very good of hearing that because, um, yeah, that would be a, a problem, and especially being UNESCO heritage. Do you have Airbnb rentals in Puebla? Yes, a lot, a lot of uh, Airbnb rentals that is possible to find. ¿Qué comida recomienda? <laughs> That's in Spanish, very good. ¿Qué comida recomienda para las personas que no toleran lo picante o son alérgicas a lo picante? Very easy. You just say no picante, no chile, no rajas, and they won't give you any, any sauce. So no problem. <laughs> we will be traveling to Veracruz and, when, and then to Oaxaca. I would love to learn to cook traditional mole. Is there a place I can go to learn? Yes, actually, we also offer cooking classes at home. So um, in case you are interested, you can send a message to Mara or to me. And of course, we will be more than happy to have you in our house and share with you an experience and, and cook with you. But if you are more into an experience of going to a school, of course, here in Puebla, we also have that option. And we also have restaurants and hotels that are promoting these kind of experiences with chefs and people that have better skills than I. And another one, a last one, can tourists drink the local water without getting ill? Not from the tap, of course. Uh, we drink water from bottles. And at home, we have big, big bottles like botellones or garrafones. So we don't drink it from directly from the tap. And this is because also uh, the minerals. So the, we say that Puebla has very heavy, heavy water. And that's the meaning of heavy, that has a lot of minerals. Apart from Puebla, is there anywhere else that you think is essential to visit while in Mexico? I'm coming from Australia. Of course, of course, I mean, it would be hard to say only one place, but I guess that the most representative places in Mexico are Oaxaca, Oaxaca City, Mexico City. If you go to the Riviera Maya, you have to go to the ruins, the Mayan ruins or archaeological sites. Uh, another state that I love is Chiapas or Guanajuato. Guanajuato is also famous for having the independence of Mexico over there. But I mean, it's hard to say only one because I love the border, the other side, which is Baja California. Baja California is a place for going and seeing the whales and scuba diving. So it's hard to say. I'm so proud of being Mexican and it's hard to say that. 
That's, that's a great way to end this uh, presentation. I think that you showed us how proud you are of your country and your city. And honestly, I, I've answered so many chats and, and um, questions. Where else can we visit in Mexico? So we'll have to talk about that and see where else we can go. Um, many of you have asked how you can get in contact with Alejandra. The PDF that I shared with you in the chat and on Facebook, her contact um, website is on the first page. So you can go and contact her there. I will also put it in the follow up email tomorrow so that you can see it as it will also be posted on the website with the recording. So you'll be able to get in contact as well. I want to thank you again, Alejandra. You, you brought us the passion of your of your city and your country, and we certainly appreciate it. Um, I want to thank everybody else for coming out. I know that it's different times in all different regions and some of you are having breakfast with us and some of you are well past midnight. So we really thank everybody for attending. Um, and, and again, uh, happy Cinco de Mayo. And I hope you've learned a little bit of, more about this day. And from now on, you can share it with your family and friends as well. Thank you again, Alejandra. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Mara. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Have a good day.